Good morning, James. Good morning, church. I like isolating. Good morning, James. Good morning, church. And just so you know, if Ryan all of a sudden disappears after today, I know nothing, okay? I heard he made a comment that is not fit for the body of Christ. The Spirit blocked it from me hearing it. Um, all I know is today, so, you know, it's amazing what one week can do, right? Last week, you guys were rejoicing with those who rejoice. Today, you're weeping with those who weep. So thank you for your 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 just compassion and your sympathy. And for the rest of you, get thee behind me, Satan, right? So, so it's interesting that, you know, Jesus in this parable talks about the seed that's sown in the soil and what seed grows and what are the, the uh, atmospheric conditions required for something to grow spiritually. My, one of my kids is doing a science experiment right now and um, he's got five potted plants and with each plant he's giving it something different as far as food. So one plant is getting soda, one plant is getting juice, one plant is getting water, and uh, I forgot what the other plant is getting. I think it's getting like a monster energy drink, and I think the last plant's getting beer, and that one's already starting to go like, like this. So, uh, and he's doing this for a Christian school too, so like, they're like, beer, oh, we know what kind of parents you have, huh? But I think all of us know enough about plants that we sit there and go, well, that's, you know, that's a silly experiment, right? What plant's going to grow with being fed Coke or what plant's going to grow being fed beer? Yet it's an in interesting process. And yet many of us don't know the finer intricacies of a plant and the roots and the food required for it to, to grow. Maybe there's a reason why we all live in the desert where plant life is easy to grow here, cactus. They don't require a lot of effort, Amen. There's some places you go, I sit there and go, I would kill every green plant around me because I'm just, that's not good with this kind of stuff. Well, spiritually speaking, your life, my life is continually compared in scriptures to a plant or to a tree. Uh, there's verses that speak of fruit bearing in a believer's life. There are verses that refer to the root in which is unseen to our physical eyes, but is clearly seen by God. What are the processes that are in place in, in not only the seed, the spiritual seed that's planted, but what are the processes in that seed taking root? What are the processes of that root being fed and nourished and growing and bearing fruit? This is the passage before us in Colossians, and this is what Paul points to. See, throughout the scriptures, you are a living organism in the hands of God. You are the ones that God says, as men and women created in his image, I'm going to do a work in you, and I'm going to do a work in you so that it grows, it blossoms, it flourishes, and it's going to yield fruit that's going to bring not only glory to God, but it's going to make an impact in our world. So today what we get a look at in Colossians chapter uh, 1 verses 3 through 8 is this process of fruit, root, and the sowing of the seeds. And if you would turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, let's read these verses in their entirety and then let's go back and comment on these three stages and we're going to start with the, the latter first. We're going to talk about the fruit of the seed of, of the gospel. Then we're going to talk about the root of that seed, and then we're going to talk about the sowing of that seed. So we're going to kind of work in reverse process because this is how Paul wants to deal with this this morning. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 3 through verse 8. Here's what the Word of God says. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus... And the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it, and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, 
our beloved fellow bond servant who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So this morning, we're going to look at this spiritual plant growth. We're going to look at this spiritual fruit bearing. And Paul is writing to this church, this church of young believers in Christ. And he's basically going to tell them right off the bat, the garden is good. The garden in which God is growing among you is healthy. It is good. And I want to thank God for what he's doing in your midst. It's cool to have the Apostle Paul say these words of encouragement in verse 3, right? He says, I'm thanking God for you. As often as I remember you, as often as I pray for you, I'm thanking God for you. So he starts with this word of encouragement. Now, Paul doesn't always start his letters with a word of encouragement. Matter of fact, case in note, the letter to the church at Galatia or Galatians, he automatically just rips into them. Because this is a church that's believing a false gospel. He's got no time for niceties. He's got no time for pleasantries, right? He is just so mad that these people are believing a false gospel, he just gets right down to business. But here in Colossians, it's a whole different tone. He wants to encourage these young believers and tell them that the garden in which God is growing in Colossae, the city, is good. And they need to hear that. Why? Because there are teachers that are coming into this city and they're teaching these young believers false doctrines, false beliefs. These are people saying, no, the gospel of Jesus is not enough. You need more. Oh, you, you don't know the secret things of God? Let us tell the secret things. Teach you the secret handshakes. Give you the secret vocabulary. And so these believers are thinking, do we have everything we need in Christ? And Paul's saying, you have all that you need in Christ. Can I just tell you, church, if you have Jesus, you have all you need pertaining to life and salvation. Okay? Don't let anyone come along and tell you there's something more or there's something that you're missing. I remember several years ago, this guy came out and said, well, what you have in your Bibles is, is good, but there's actually like secret language below the surface of the Bible. And I'm just sitting there going, Really? And people were believing this stuff. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't let anyone come and shake your confidence in what you have in Christ. If you have Christ, you have everything you need. Amen? So Paul writes to this church, and the first thing he notes is this, the fruit of the gospel in their lives. The fruit of the gospel. And for Paul... His way of saying the fruit of genuine Christianity consists of three things. Faith, love, and hope. I mean, this is basically the apostle's shorthand to say, what does a believer's life look like? What are the evidences of genuine faith? Three things. Faith, love, and hope. Now, you might remember that is a similar phrase brought to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the famous love chapter. How many of us have been to weddings and heard this passage quoted? And Paul says, there are three great things in life, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of those three things is love. But here, he reverses the order. And I'm going to tell you right now that the order is not necessarily entirely important, but there's a reason why he lists today in Colossians this order, faith, love, and hope. It's because of the three points we're going to look at this morning. Number one, there's a past experience of faith. There's a present expression of love. And then there's a future expectation of hope. So Paul wants you to understand something, that there's, there's something vertical that's taking place in these believers' lives. There's something horizontal that's taking place in these believers' lives. And there's something that fuels both faith and love, and that is hope. So let's take this apart, if we could, piece by piece. So I want you to see how important this is. Because what you're going to see is that Christ is the object of their faith. The believers are the object of their love, and heaven is the object of their hope. And those are important things to remember. So Christ is the object of their faith. 
The church and other believers are the object of their hope, or their love. And then heaven, the future, is the object of their hope. Let's take these things apart bit by bit if we could. So first, the past experience of faith. Notice what it says in verse 4. We heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Notice this is not just some sort of ambiguous faith in whatever you want to have faith in. This is not some sort of arbitrary thing that you can just go ahead and choose to to have faith in whatever you want to put your faith in. This is a clear, objective thing that they've put their faith in. And what have they put their faith in? In Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, this is critical to who you are in Christ. See, Faith refers to that component of the Christian life where you are saying, my faith is rooted in trust and in reliance on Christ. He is the only sustaining, objective thing to put your faith into. So it's just not about having faith in something. See, faith itself has no intrinsic value. Faith is derives its worth and significance from what you put your faith in. It's the object that you put your faith in. And can I tell you right now, there's a lot of people that are putting their faith in something that is not worth diddly squat. Sounds like a phrase my dad would say. I feel old right now. (laughs) Think about, like, right now, our country, right? There's this big government shutdown going on, and everyone's freaking out. It is rocking the idols in a lot of people's hearts. Should we ever put our faith in government? If you have not learned this lesson, don't put your faith in government. Don't put your faith in border walls. Don't put your faith in the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. Don't put your faith in kings or kingdoms. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been men and women who have had their faith dashed because they put their faith in something of no intrinsic value. The reason why this world continues to drown in hopelessness is because they are putting their faith in things that are worth nothing. But you, in Christ, this is a whole different situation. You have put your faith in the one true sustaining objective standard that rises above all other things this world wants to offer you as a Messiah, as a Lord, as a Savior. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ is the one that is full of quality and worth. He is the one that is, the, uh, that is able to bring you an authentic faith. He is the only sufficient object. He is the only definite source. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that if you don't put your faith in Christ, your faith in anything else is hopeless. Amen? Don't trust anyone or anything but Christ. Paul is writing to this church and says, your vertical faith in Jesus is right on. Don't ever lose sight of that. Who you are in Christ. That saving faith is grounded in the gospel and it is the word of God that gives us assurance. So he says, church, thank you for loving Christ, putting your trust in him because nothing else is worthy of your trust. What assurance, as sure as Christ is risen from the dead and right now seated at the right hand of the Father, so sure are you in your faith that nothing will ever come to disrupt what God has done in your hearts in faith in Christ. Amen? Assurance. Write down that word, assurance. Assurance, because there is something that is derived from such an objective standard of truth that Christ was who he is claimed to be he backed up who he claimed to be through all his miraculous uh works his healings his miracles he goes to the cross he dies a death he didn't deserve to die he's buried he's risen again on the third day and to this day it is the greatest drama to ever be played out in the human redemption story and that men and women's lives have been changed by this objective truth it's not like i hope he's been raised ladies and gentlemen there's an empty tomb in jerusalem right now amen there's not this dead messiah lying in 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 decomposed manner somewhere in the middle east you know what there's people that have been transformed by this living truth there are eyewitnesses ladies and gentlemen there's nothing else objective to put your faith in than the personal work of jesus christ and that gives us assurance 
and we can meet and we can argue, and I'm going to tell you right now, the evidence for, uh, for a living Savior is so well documented that my assurance in Him being risen, seated right now at the right hand of the Father, woo, gives, me, gives me chills just thinking about it. But what does that do? That assurance that this vertical relationship with Christ that I have by faith, and let me just tell you, that faith itself, faith itself is a gift from God. Can I tell you right now, the Bible is clear. You don't have faith to believe. And Ephesians chapter 2 says, even the faith given to you to have faith is a gift from God. So put that in your spiritual pipe and smoke it, right? Again, I, I feel like my dad again. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the work that God has done in your lives is a work that he is guaranteed to carry out till you meet him in glory one day. From, from start to finish, the author of your faith is God. From start to finish, the perfecter of your faith is God. And I tell you what, that brings such assurance that knowing who I am in Christ and where my faith is rooted in him gives me now the opportunity to love. Point number two, there's a present expression of love that now happens. There's a reason why Jesus says, to the degree you understand how much you've been loved by God, to the same degree you are now free to love other people in Christ. Can I tell you what? People who understand the gospel the most clearly are the ones that, most, that love most liberally. I was meeting with someone for, for lunch the other day, and, I, and I'm just across the table from them, and I, just, I made this statement. I've probably made it before, but at that moment, it just seemed to resonate with me and this, this, this guy I was meeting with. And I just said, you know what? One thing that will never come back to us in a negative way is when you love people too much. <laughs> what do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose, right? If your faith is in Christ and that and in him is intrinsic worth and value and, and all surpassing riches, we ought to be the people who love the most liberally. And at the end of the day, is someone going to come to you and say, you've loved me too much? Are you kidding me? We as believers in Christ ought to be out there just love bombing people right and left. Right? Just, just doesn't matter who they are, the color of the skin, their voting persuasions, what movies they like, what music they listen to, what kind of cars they drive. All the things that there just continues to be this prejudice and this racism and this division. We ought to be the people saying, no, we're coming together. Because God has created a new person in Christ, a new humanity a new breed of people and people who love like crazy. This was the thing that the Roman Empire early on when the church was growing said, we have to outlove the Christians in order to stop this thing called Christianity. And when you have Christ and you have assurance in him, there's no way the world could ever outlove those whose hearts have been gripped and are now compelled to love like Christ. Amen? So the church here in Colossae says, I've heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have for all the saints. Circle the word all. All means all, and that's all all means, and that's all I'll say about the word all in this context. See, ladies and gentlemen, you are not to discriminate. You are not to choose who you love and who you don't love. The genuineness of your faith is evidenced in how much you love. And by love, it is a self-denying, self-abrogated type of love that you say, I'm going to consider you more important than me. I'm going to come along and sacrifice whatever I need to so that you would come to know Christ, you would grow in Christ, that you would experience all the riches there are in Christ. See, there's something different about us. And perhaps the greatest evangelistic tool we have in our belt, church, is to love each other like crazy. So like John 13, Jesus says, the world will know you're my disciples. The world will know you're my man, you're my woman, because of your love for each other. And instead of complaining and bickering and fighting, we need to come together and love each other liberally. Amen? See, ladies and gentlemen, the church is called to something so, so far superior than this world could ever know. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Look what Paul says in another place. For in Christ Jesus, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. That doesn't count for anything, but only faith working through love. 
You show me a person that loves like Jesus, I'll show you a person that is so connected in their faith to Christ. He goes on and says in Hebrews chapter 6, and if you th- you're looking for some reward for your loving people, remember this, for God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. See, love is not always recognized. Love is not always rewarded. Love is not always applauded. You don't get the pats on the back and all the accolades that we tend to look for. But God sees. And do you not think he is going to be a God who rewards you for how liberally you love? Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the marks of your faith. And the two, faith and love, are so important. Why? Because if you have love without faith, you just have this sloppy and insipid, gushy feelings that it's not objectively grounded in anything. But if you have faith and not love, I'm going to tell you, look out, because these are the most arid and pompous and eventually mean-spirited and unkind people. I have faith, but if that faith doesn't translate into love, you become a legalistic Pharisee and no one wants to have anything to do with you. Can I get an amen? Amen. You need faith with love, and you need love with faith. The two work hand in hand. The vertical influences the horizontal, and the horizontal brings glory to what you have vertically. Number three, but what is it that fuels both these things? Future expectation of hope. The only thing that compels you to continue to look to Christ and love people liberally is the hope that is reserved for you yet future. Look what Paul says. Not only have I heard of your faith in Christ and the love which you have for all the saints, but because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. What you understand in a future perspective greatly influences who you are now. Say all of a sudden you got a letter from an attorney that said, hey, your Uncle Bud just passed away the other day and he left you a $10 million inheritance. But you're not going to get that inheritance for 20 years. Do you not think the next 20 years is going to greatly affect the way you live knowing that you have an inheritance waiting for you yet to come 20 years from now of $10 million? Amen? See, When there is something that is guaranteed to you in the future, it's going to greatly impact your life in the present. And this is why hope is important. This is why Peter says, it's not just any hope. 1 Peter 1, verse 4 says, you have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. See, this is the living hope that is guarded that no one can... touch this is the living hope that is in heaven reserved for you that no one could ever break in and steal away this is the hope laid up for you in heaven reserved for you in christ that no one could ever tarnish destroy diminish or whatever this is a guarantee to all who believe in christ and so paul says here you are church you have this this faith and this love springing from something that is future for you And the word laid up, right, that word hope laid up for you means it is on reserve. Your hope is safe, it is secure, and is locked away in heaven for you, far far away from anything that would ever threaten its integrity. And you think about the words of Paul here in 1 Peter, you need to know that the hope that you have in Christ will never, ever come to an end. You can never exhaust what is yours in Christ. You will never be able to diminish what is yours in Christ. And it has the capacity to enthrall and fascinate and impart joy into your life forever. Don't miss this, please. This is such a critical point. Write this down. Hope expects what faith believes. And if you're not believing in faith, then your hope is perhaps dimming, if not totally gone. See, ladies and gentlemen, we are continually bombarded with voices in this world to tell us to, to, to just wrap our hearts, wrap our minds, exhaust all our energy on these things. 
And if you continue to not see what's reserved for you in heaven, your hope will be starved. Believers have a confident expectation. We are being guarded for glory. God wants to protect your heart. There's a reason why he says, lay up for yourselves treasures not on earth, but where? In heaven. So I've got an illustration. My, my buddy Mike Bachmeyer, one of, of all the deacons at, at Missio Day, he's one of them. I always like to say that. So. Um, so last night, this was fun, after the Cowboys lost, Okay, uh, after the Cowboys loss, reality hasn't fully set in yet, but that's cool. Uh, I text Mike, and I said, Mike, do you have a really, really long rope I, c- I could have? And so out of concern, he goes, are you, are you doing okay, right? Like, <laughs> um, so here's what I want to illustrate. So today, uh, Deacon Mike is going to play the role of Jesus, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, we're going to illustrate this. So what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this rope off the spool as Mike takes the spool and he's going to work his way out the door and disappear around the corner. So this is going to require a little participation. So maybe come through here. Uh, make sure no one gets tied up with the, 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 the rope. This is good rope. Yeah. We spare no expense to show you guys these illustrations, okay? So what you need to understand regarding this rope, now the fun part is going to be rolling it all back up again, but we'll deal with that later. So So what the Bible says regarding your hope, the book of Hebrews has an amazing verse in chapter 6. Keep going. you got a long ways to go, Mike. Good knowing you. See you later. All right. The book of Hebrews says Jesus Christ is your anchor of your hope. He is the forerunner of your faith. And in faith, now you have an anchor in Christ who is no longer on earth, but is now seated at the right hand of the Father in in heaven. But what you need to understand with the language there is that an anchor is tethered to something, right? Like, I'm sure none of us uh, would have to exhaust too much mental acumen to to wrap our minds around the fact that if we're in a boat and we drop this really heavy anchor, that boat's going to be stable. Why? because of the heaviness and the weight of the anchor in which that boat's attached to. Well, if Christ is the author and perfecter of your faith, if he's the anchor of your hope and he's in heaven right now as your forerunner, you're attached to him with a rope that can never be cut. You're attached to him with a rope that can never, ever be destroyed. And even though you can't see Jesus, you have this rope of faith that is tethered to the anchor, capital A, anchor, Jesus, who is rooted in heaven right now, and your life is attached to him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what you have 24-7 in Christ. You have an anchor that can never be moved, no matter what storm or difficulty may come your way. He is the forerunner for your faith. He is the high priest that has gone in the Holy of Holies and torn that veil in half, and he has made atonement for your sins he is the perfect sacrifice and with you on the end of that rope and him on the other is your anchor nothing could ever take away the hope you have in christ amen and by way of another illustration you may also want to think of it as your life in christ now as an umbilical cord that is attached to a father that loves you more than you could ever imagine that there is this relationship that now we have via this thing called faith that fuels us, that nourishes us, that takes care of us, and nothing will ever, ever destroy what we have and who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? All right. Thank you, Mike. You can come back now. Oh, he was hiding behind Tim. Give it up for... So, you have this anchor, and again, the anchor is Christ, because the main concern at the end of the day is not what you know, it's whom you know. And Jesus is that forerunner of our faith. And this is the mentality we must embrace as believers that's going to nourish our lives in the here and now because we are continually bombarded with nourishing our souls off things that have no eternal value. Do you understand how important this is? That we eagerly or ought to eagerly look forward to a time when Christ Jesus 
and his work in us will become complete. It's not, we're not yet complete in Christ. The wedding feast has not been fully consummated yet. There is a future for us, not just, you know, that impacts our lives now, but there's a future for us that we have no idea that is in store for us. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what keeps us going. Write down Hebrews chapter 11. It is the great hall of faith chapter. And I want you to know how the men and women of of old were able to be used of God the way they were is because it was by faith they lived their lives. What was their faith in? It wasn't in necessarily things present. It was in things that were yet future. Abraham was able to leave his home and go into a foreign land because the Bible says he was not seeking an earthly city. He was seeking a heavenly city. Moses, who was surrounded with all the riches of Egypt, he considered all the riches of Egypt nothing compared to the surpassing riches of knowing Christ himself. Can you stop? Consider this. Perhaps we are not as hope-filled as we'd want to be because we keep buying into the lie that this, this world offers all the riches that could ever please our heart. And ladies and gentlemen, this world was never designed to to meet all the needs you have. To provide you all the riches of experience that you need, only Christ can do that. And if you continue to lose sight of that, you will continue to be ill-nourished when it comes to your hope. No wonder our hope is dim. We're so fixated on keeping track of our steps on our Fitbits that we're no longer keeping our steps as far as walking in the Spirit. Amen? We're so busy binge-watching all the shows that come out on Netflix. Oh, and they are masters of making sure you don't have a life outside of what they are airing on the television. And I'm going to tell you right now, the reason your hope is dim is because you're binge-watching Netflix and you're not binge-watching what God is doing through the Scriptures that He's provided you. Ladies and gentlemen, you keep seeking and striving for what the the world offers as riches and you keep coming up empty. When will we wake up? Nothing nourishes like Christ and nothing nourishes like the promises of God that are found in him and in his word. But pastor, my life is just empty. Well, because you're filling it with all the wrong type of gasoline. Right? You can't put sugar in your gas tank. Amen? You must continue to realize that as pleasant as this world is right now, and I'm not saying that we walk through this world like misers, and, you know, the world offers pleasant things, but nothing is compared to the substance that we have in God. This world offers shadows, but God is the substance. Amen? Earthly joys are fragmented beings, but, the, but God is the sun. Amen? Earthly refreshment is as at best like sipping intermittent springs from this fresh mountain water, but God is the ocean. And C.S. Lewis says it perfectly. If indeed we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised to us in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. And we go on making mud pies in the slums when right around the corner there's a holiday at the ocean that's offered to us. Why we don't have hope? Because we're starving ourselves of the hopeful expectation that is ours in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Right? That doesn't mean we don't hurt. That doesn't mean we don't have pain. That doesn't mean we don't get frustrated. But all I know is that Paul is saying comparatively this world is nothing compared to what is being promised to us in christ amen that our present sufferings are nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory check out second corinthians chapter four look what paul says so we do not lose heart right you don't lose heart why because faith in christ 
rooted in a hope, in a future that is, that is going to be unchangeable for all of us in him, we don't lose heart. Because what does hope do? Hope keeps our hearts buoyant. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Amen? Hair falling out, sags, all that stuff. Yeah, right. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal for we know that if we if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed we have a building from god right a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens And he continues says, for this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He was prepared for us, this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Woo! You can't miss that, you guys. And that works right in concert with Ephesians chapter 1 where he says you have been given the Holy Spirit as a promise ring that he's engaged to you forever and one day the engagement is going to turn into a full blast wedding ceremony and you're not ready for that party. Amen? The Holy Spirit is given to you as a deposit, an earnest deposit, as a guarantee of vast riches yet to come in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. And this is what Jesus himself embodied. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. This is our master. This is our Lord. Looking to Jesus, which we should always do, right? The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus considered these momentary light afflictions nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory and hope in him and hope in the god and the promises of god reminds us of this you can continue to carry on you can continue to endure you can continue to persevere why because he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of christ jesus can i get an amen what incredible confidence that is now born in the heart of every believer that follows these truths that embraces these truths that we understand that there's something yet future that's far better for us than anything could be ever offered in the present faith love and hope three marks of genuine christianity but these fruit can only be derived from a particular root And that root consists of two things. Look how Paul continues. Because I'm not here to tell you how to become great fruit bearers. I'm here to encourage us to make sure that our root is where it needs to be. Because we can go around as fruit inspectors, and there's a lot of people who may share, say they love or they say they have hope. But fruit bearing is not something you work on. Fruit bearing is a natural product of what happens when the vine is attached to the branch and that's attached to the tree amen fruit does not exert effort to grow fruit grows as a result of its relationship to the root of the tree Woo! how about that for some horticultural statements right right look what paul says yeah here we go you had okay verse five because of the hope laid up for you in heaven which you previously heard in the word of truth the gospel so number one the message is truth it's a message of truth and again this is not subjective truth well whatever's true for you is true for you but whatever's true for me is true for me you ever heard that sort of kind of jello like philosophy it's you know I, i love it when people say there's no such thing as objective truth can you really make that truth statement objectively because then in and of itself it's a fallacy of a statement and kind of falls in and of itself there is thing of the thing called uh, objective truth. And isn't it interesting that even with the gospel truth, that, have you ever heard someone say, and that's the gospel truth? You ever heard people say that? People say that, believers, non-believers. Why? Because there was a time when truth was related to the gospel because there's nothing truer than the gospel. Amen? And that's why in, in a court of law, people say, you know, you're going to say this, the truth, uh, the whole truth and nothing but the 
truth, right? See, there's a world that is just so longing to know truth, and yet I sit there and go, are they? Because the most objective truth has come to us in the personal work of Jesus Christ. Amen? See, this is the root. The root of the tree must be found in Christ. Wrong fruit, wrong root. Right fruit, right root. Even Jesus himself said, does a good tree produce bad fruit? And a good bad tree produce good fruit? No. See, this is important. Why? Because I never want anyone to leave with a false assurance that they are saved in Christ. What you believe determines how you behave. Right living comes from right believing. We are not about behavior modification at Missio Day. This is not about you going out and just bearing all good fruit. My prayer is that you would have the right root, and out of that right root, the fruit bearing will happen. But lest we become so truthful that we forget about the gospel is also a message of grace. See, notice what Paul says in verse 6. This has come to you, this message of, of the word of truth, the gospel, just as in all the world it is constantly bearing fruit increasing, even as it has been doing since you also d- heard of it from the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Can I tell you what's really remarkable about Christianity? The only religion in the world that says, do not lean on your pious works. Don't think you have to do this many good deeds. You don't have to crucify yourselves. You don't have to walk up the steps a hundred times to the most holy place you could ever visit in the world. You don't have to say so many prayers or mantras. All you have to do is believe. Jesus plus nothing equals genuine Christianity. And the moment someone says Jesus plus something is false. It is hopeless. It is lifeless. And now all of a sudden it becomes something dependent upon you. And let me just tell you, I don't have hope in you to be saved. I don't have hope in me to be saved. Jesus plus nothing equals genuine faith. Can I tell you how wonderful this message is? That this Jesus plus nothing is what, it it matters that God loves us apart from our works, apart from our good deeds. Because you want to know why? If your faith was based upon your good works, you would continually live in misery because of how much you fall short and fail. But there's one who has never fallen short and there's one who's never failed and that is the anchor of my faith, Jesus, and he lived life perfectly so that I didn't have to. Why? Because I couldn't do it. Can I get an amen? So there's this message of truth, this message of grace, that is the root. If you believe that, And again, it's not some intellectual assent to facts. It is a heart that's been moved by God, a work that he can only perform. It is going to evidence itself in faith, love, and hope. Why is this important? Because you were led to belief by somebody, right? You just didn't like wake up all of a sudden from a dream or some, some episode of Black Mirror and all of a sudden go, hey, I believe. Someone brought you the good news. Someone when I was a young teenager, a neighbor brought my family the good news. Which means now that we understand that God is committed to a singular process in which men and women may be saved. No one is saved apart from hearing the good news of Jesus. The question is, will we as his people be moved to share the good news of Jesus with people? The last point, the sowing of the gospel. This is why church planting is so important, right? This is why we're here. You know, we started something from nothing, and now we get to minister to people the the, the seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why James and Liz and that team were, were praying for to go into Phoenix so that they can love people with the seed of the gospel. We are all called to be sowers of the seeds. Why is this important? Because there can take no root of anything unless the seed is sown there. And look what Paul says, verse 6 into verse 7. You have come to believe this message which has been going out into the entire world. Can I tell you something remarkable about the seed of God? 
that it can be planted anywhere, grow anywhere in the most adverse of conditions, and it will grow and bear fruit. Think about that. You can go to Antarctica and plant the seeds of the gospel. It's going to grow. Take that same seed and go to Canada. You can even go to Dallas, Texas. You can even go to Los Angeles. You can even go to Philadelphia. You can go to Tokyo. You can go to Munich. You can go anywhere in the world. And the singular seed will not only be planted and take root in hearts of men and women, it will bear fruit no matter what environment it's planted in. And we sit there and go, wow. And I'm, God has committed himself to no other process. There is no other process in which men and women be saved but to believe in the one whom he sent, and that is Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There's no one saved in anyone else but Jesus Christ. Amen? John chapter 14, verse 6. No one comes to the Father but through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So you look at the Gospels and you sit there and look what Paul's saying. He says, you have been bearing fruit and you're increasing. Why? Because verse 7, just as you learned it from Epaphras, here is the sower of the seed. Remember what I told you last week about this dude? I love Epaphras. He's a guy who was saved under the Apostle Paul's teaching. And he was at a conference, I guess, where Paul was at. And he heard the message. He was changed by the message of Jesus. He takes the gospel back to his hometown of Colossae. And where there was never a word about Christ, he now brings the word about Jesus. And men and women are saved in Christ. And they start a little home Bible study at Philemon's house, right? Philemon's got his own issues with Onesimus, but that's another story for another time. But there's Epaphras planting the seeds. Lives are being changed in this little place called Colossae, in this place we call Asia Minor, that has had a lot of history. And I'm going to tell you right now that when King Xerxes of Persia came in and conquered this territory, nothing compared to the day the seed of the gospel was planted in this city. And when King Cyrus came over and took place of Persia with the Greek army, nothing was more powerful than the day Epaphras brought the seed of the gospel to Colossae. Amen? And when Epaphras brought that seed of the gospel, there were no banners unfurled to announce the arrival of this mighty empire. There was no trumpets blowing, this mighty fanfare of victory. There was a man who was faithful to what he has experienced, and he was telling people about Jesus. That was the greatest day in Colossae ever. Why? Because someone said, I will sow the seeds of the gospel. And men and women now for time and eternity are changed because of Epaphras' heart to see people know Jesus. Can I tell you something, you guys? Let me take the burden off your shoulders right now and tell you this. You and I will never be able to save people. But the word of the seed of the gospel of Christ is more than able to transform lives. I'm not asking you to be an eloquent speaker because God is not dependent upon how eloquent your speech is. He's not looking to you to be the most wise of debaters or, or you know, this master one who can argument the truths of the faith. God is not going to work through how well you master an argument or a debate. What God is saying is open your mouth and let my word be planted and you watch him do the transforming work. Can I get an amen? We have far too long leaned on celebrities. We have far too long leaned on those who are eloquent and wise. And, and all he's looking to do is find faithful men and women who are willing to open up their mouths and share the truth of Christ. And when the truth of Christ is sown, watch God work. I thank God for a man like Epaphras. I thank God for neighbors that love my family in North Phoenix back in the, the 1980s. I thank for God for the men and women who told you about Jesus. And the only reason why you're here and you're saved in him is because someone opened their mouths and told you about Christ. And this is now my commission to you as God's people. What you have tasted, tell others about. We're so quick to throw a Yelp review because we found a great Korean barbecue restaurant. What about Jesus? Right? I love going on our Facebook page and like people reviewing churches, right? Like as if this church got 4.7 on, on the, the rating index. Like we need to go check this place out. God must be at work there. Let me just tell you something. You 
will glorify God the most, not from getting the best Google review for your church, but how faithful you are to open your mouths and just tell people about Jesus. You can stumble over your words. You can be totally confused at what someone's bringing at you because they believe in Scientology or something weird. But all I know is when the truth of God is, is going out, it never comes back empty. Do you believe that? I believe it. Because it's changed me. A punk like me. And it's taking place all over the world right now. Men and women are being changed by the word of the, of the truth of the gospel. Will you become like an Epaphras and go back to your places of work and school and neighborhoods just to tell people about Jesus? Because thank God he's committed himself to this process. And it's not based upon how excellent you are. It's uh, about how faithful you are. In closing, I saw this commercial, interesting commercial. It's called Wonder... Let me get it right. Wonder Bar Together. I'm watching the news last night through my tears after the Cowboys game. And there's all this in this Germany-U.S. relationship event taking place all over the country. Wonder Bar Together. All 50 states, thousands of events to celebrate the relationship between Germany and U.S. I thought, what an interesting little thing. And then I thought to myself, wait, we do this every Sunday as the people of God celebrating the relationship between him and us. Wunderbar together every Sunday between us and God. And boy, I tell you, the more you celebrate that, 50 states, God's at work all over the world. And he's sowing the seeds and we have something to celebrate so that the world goes, why are you celebrating? Because there's a God who's loved us more than we could ever ask or imagine. And he does it because of the grace he's shown us in Christ. Amen. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the message of your word. Lord, my prayer is that you would continue to, not only among us, but through us, sow the seeds of the truth of the gospel of Christ. So that that seed would take root in the hearts of men and women and grow into a fruitful tree that will glorify you and continue to do good in this world. And it's only because of the gospel of Christ. There's no other na name in which we are to be saved but in him. Thank you for such a secure salvation. Thank you for now a confident hope. Lord, continue to allow us to grow hungrier and hungrier for the things that are laid up for us in heaven. To continue to lose an appetite for anything in this world. And may our hope in Christ forever and ever grow and be flourish and blossom for your glory and our good. Thank you for today, for the gathering of your people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. See you soon. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.